live at IBM's IOD conference here in Las Vegas. This is the Cube, our flagship program. We go out through the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon. I'm joined by my co-host Dave Vellante, and our next guest is Tom Daub, CEO of Centerstone Research Institute. Welcome to the Cube. Well, thank you very much. So, tell us a little bit about what you guys do first, then we'll jump into some questions. We know uh, we've got some good case study data uh, with what you're doing. So, tell we us about do. the company first. So, Centerstone Research Institute is a mission-driven nonprofit organization. We're in Tennessee and Indiana, and we focus on bridging the gap that exists between research and practice. So, every day we learn um, mountains of new information that come out in research that affect both healthcare and also behavioral healthcare, mental health, and substance abuse, which is what we focus on. And we're all about trying to bring that research closer to practice. And data, big data, is one of the ways that we've been doing that. So um, just take us through a little bit of how you get the data. Uh, is, it your, is it from your own sources or external sources? Uh, a range of sources. So healthcare, in particular, uh, has uh, not leveraged over the years all of the data that we collect. We're required for regulatory reasons, for payer reasons, to gather mountains of information uh, in healthcare. And only recently have organizations begun to really mine that information and use it to improve care. So we get data out of uh, electronic health records as, as a primary source of information about the services that are provided, about uh, patient outcomes, how people are doing in care. But we also bring in other sources of data. So for example, one of the things that we've done is look at the impact of just weather conditions on our uh, care delivery model. So when people don't make it to the clinics, is it because of bad weather conditions? And how can we take that into account and in making our business process more efficient? So uh, one of the things we learned, uh, Dave and I were um, talking with GE, and they do have a, a lot of oil and gas companies. And they, did, they found that they've always stayed within their businesses of looking at their data, their data warehouses. But when they started using external data sets, in their case, oceanography information. Mm -hmm. The insights were amazing. So can yeah. you share with us an example of where you guys have, you know, had your normal data sets and then went outside your scope and brought in other kind of categorical data or industry data? Have you guys, can you share a little bit of insight there? Well, the, the real power, I, I think, in, in data is bringing together different data sources. So in most organizations, you have data that are siloed. So you might have, in a healthcare organization, you might have clinical billing information in the electronic health record. You might have an HR information in HR systems. You might have financial information in financial systems, the general ledger. So by crossing silos and bringing that information together, you get more power. Now, as, as you're talking about, we can also go outside of those systems and bring in external sources of data. So you know, we, for example, brought in weather information, uh, and we're able to look at um, the impact of that on whether people are able to make it into our clinics or services so we can manage our staffing more effectively. So um, you, oh, good. Go ahead. So you guys are essentially building a big data warehouse with exactly. this information. Take us uh, back to the driver for that system. When did it all start? How are you doing it? Maybe take us through sort of the, the, the case study of what you're doing. We, we started our, our journey, our analytics journey, about five or six years ago. Uh, we were very fortunate as a nonprofit to get investment, philanthropic investment, that helped us start this effort from the Josie Davis Foundation and also from the Ayers Foundation in Nashville. And um, that helped us get our uh, effort off the ground. They funded the initial infrastructure that we purchased, some of the software and hardware we needed, also some of the training that we needed for staff. We had to grow our own data scientists. Uh, of course, they're hard to recruit. Uh, and we were able to b bring people in who are interested in solving really important social problems and applying the latest uh, data science methodology to, uh, to address them. So first thing we did is we began to, to build all of that, uh, the data infrastructure. And we did that by focusing on key business problems. Uh, as every healthcare organization faces today, we, we had several crises, that, uh, business crises that we faced. Payers were changing the way they did business. The healthcare environment is changing very rapidly. And that created business opportunities for us as, as in analytics to help solve those business problems and demonstrate our value. So, okay, so you put it in this infrastructure, right. and then you said you had, to, you had to home grow your own data scientist, right? So what was that like? I mean, you essentially, did you find like a, a lead data scientist that could train everybody and, and transfer that knowledge? That's a major challenge for a lot of organizations. How'd you do it? Well, it's interesting. So as a, as a research institute, we, we created a, we, we took the approach of creating a center of excellence around analytics. Uh, prior to starting our effort, we had three separate 
uh, data groups within the organization. We had a group in our quality improvement area that focused on quality improvement data. We had a team in our, um, our information technology uh, area that just did general reporting. And then we had um, uh, statisticians, which were in my group at that time, doing research work. Uh, we, we put that team together. It was very inter interdisciplinary, uh, you know, people with PhDs and computer scientists and quality folks. Uh, and they really learned from each other. Uh, so we, we, you know, we have different people focused on different aspects of the work, but we were able to bring in people, attract people honestly that were interested in solving key social problems. They connect to the mission of the organization that we're focused on very important issues of mental health and substance abuse as an industry and as a society, uh, and they want to be a part of solving that. So that's actually helped us draw people in that uh, a small organization honestly wouldn't usually have access to. Okay, so you got a mission, you got funding, you got uh, you got tech, mm -hmm. you got obviously have domain expertise, you got data science. Was there any other ingredient that you needed to succeed? Um, a crisis, actually, would, would be my, my answer to that question. We had, uh, in, in our primary business, so Centerstone is a, a large behavioral health care provi provider organization. We serve about 75,000 people a year with mental health and substance abuse problems. And we have primary operations in two states, in Tennessee and Indiana. Both states in recent years have gone through significant um, environmental challenges. Uh, contract changes, state regulatory changes, other things that happened that, that we're going to make it very hard for us to be able to continue to do business as usual. And our analytics group was able to come in in both situations and help the business owners um, on, get the data to understand the situation, to make the good strategic and tactical decisions to manage through it, which helped us thrive and continue to do the work that we needed to do to meet our social mission um, in an era of, of shrinking funding and, and environmental challenges. So talk about the data science. You mentioned, and, you know, we had this conversation with Dr. Tim uh, Buckman earlier, um, his comment on, on, online that said, hey, you know, he's a high-priced employee managing air traffic control of the hospital. But then he turned around and said, no, no, actually there's leverage in that because what he's doing is automating and bringing in more data points. Mm -hmm. um, so that was an interesting phenomenon. So again, in your organization, you have a scaling issue where you have a lot of people interested in helping, yep. but a lot of times the brain can't talk to the arms and legs, if you will, fast enough. So this is the social business phenomenon. How are you guys using the analytics to almost take that top-down approach but enabling an organic participation? Could you kind of read that together, because that's a challenge that many feel is, is critical. I want to enable organic and right. not be top-down oriented, but you still can do that. One of the things that I'm most proud of in, in, in our effort has been our, our ability and our success in getting staff involved, uh, frontline staff, managers, people who are making decisions every day out in the field. And as a, you know, we may be doing some, of the, some complex analysis and, and you know, predictive models and so forth within our analytics team, but it's really about using that information. You know, a model's only, only so good as it is b being used on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it, it was those um, business challenges that helped us drive adoption through the user base. So we had external pressures that helped us um, really drive the cultural change necessary within the organization to Im incre increase and improve our use of analytics throughout the management team. So you're five or six years in, what, what kind of results have you seen? Uh, we've seen tremendous business results. So as healthcare is shifting currently uh, in health reform from a, an environment where they, they used to pay for fee for service, you know, so you essentially see a client and you get paid for that, regardless of what your outcome is, it's shifting to payment for value. And what value is, is it's really the equation dividing outcomes, your outcome, your unit of, of cure, divided by your cost to achieve it. You know, so for example, a new drug that can extend life by a couple of months and costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe a, a good provide a good outcome, but it may not be good value because of the increased expense is, is so great. Um, we've been very focused, and we're talking here at this conference about how do we improve healthcare value? And behavioral health is really one of the areas that we have a great opportunity to do that because behavioral health, mental health and substance abuse is implicated in the, the very heavily in the increasing healthcare costs that we have as a country. So people show up in the emergency departments, hospital readmissions, those kinds of things all connect to 
mental health and substance abuse issues. Yeah, so I mean, essentially you described an ROI equation. Unit of care over uh, cost to achieve. That's benefit over cost to achieve a benefit. <clears throat> now, what I get excited about is that traditionally in the technology business, you know, generally, but specifically in healthcare, the best way to get an ROI was to cut the denominator. Yeah. And what you're talking about is driving the numerator, that unit of, of, of cure. Mm -hmm. um, what metrics are you using to drive that, right. that numerator? So we have a number of different outcome measures that we, we, that we, that we gather. So in our, in our setting, when we see people, and this is typical of mental health and substance abuse settings, we'll ask people questions about whether they're getting better or not. So you might, we might see somebody who's depressed or has a substance abuse problem, and we'll ask them questions. Are you using drugs and alcohol less, or are you, is your mood improved? So we gather that information, and then we're able to track over time the positive or, in some cases, negative outcome that is occurring with an individual. So as we track that, um, we're able to input that as data into our models to assess, are we increasing outcomes and are we, are we able to reduce costs as a, as, a, as a function of that? One of the, the cutting edge things that we're working on today is actually modeling the decision-making process that, um, and particularly physicians and medical providers, other healthcare providers in our system use in care. So often in a fee-for-service model, you're incentivized to provide more care than somebody needs. And if you just stop when somebody gets well, it's amazing how much value that can create in healthcare delivery. So, so you're affecting both sides of the equation, right? Exactly. Yeah. You, and there's in, in ways other than just stopping spending here. And, and we've shown with some of our uh, with some of our modeling that we've done, you can actually improve both. You can we've we've shown that you can increase outcomes by roughly um, you know, 42 percent, and well, I think it's actually 60 percent, and decrease costs by 42 percent. So one of the things we talked about earlier is that modeling is great. We want to talk about that in a second mm -hmm. on the auto, because that's automation. When you can automate things, yeah. that scales. But the data accuracy is critical. So how do you guys make sure that the quality of the data, when you're going and doing the modeling, because you're modeling decision making, which is important, uh, which puts the puts new capabilities in the hands of maybe real users. The issue of data quality is huge, and I mean this is an area where I would I would probably depart from the the conventional wisdom around data governance. Um, you know, certainly data governance is an important thing, but in our experience, it is you know the first time you put data out for people to use from a production system, you're going to find uh, problems with data quality. And the only way to resolve that is, to, is, to, is transparency. It's to take that data, make it available to people so they can see the problems that, that exist and figure out what they can do so with that. So basically, if you control it, mm -hmm. you're always going to have a quality snafu. Essentially, well, not, not, and again, some fun, not put words in your mouth, but there potentially could be a quality snafu versus empowering folks you it's, iterate through, is that I, what you're I saying? I think you can get to the same place through both methods, but the data governance method, you often you're trying to make sure everything's right before you move data out, and you have to do that in certain mission critical areas. Yeah. If it's a life or death, if you're, if you're in an emergency room, yeah. you can't put out messy data. But in a lot of situations, you can afford to do this, and people use production systems in very interesting and creative ways to do their job that usually makes sense in the context of their job, but create messy data. And when you shed light on that, yeah. that stuff gets cleaned up. That's something I, I didn't realize when we started our work, is how powerful that, that, just that visibility and transparency factor would be in helping improve the data quality, which would ultimately feed back into our models. I'm interested in um, how you're organized to sort of a, a address these opportunities, really, is what you're describing. We did a, a, an event with MIT in July. Mm -hmm. It was the Chief Data Officer uh, Symposium. And there was a sort of a big debate, really it wasn't much debate amongst the chief data officers, but there was certainly a big debate in the industry as to whether or not you should even have a chief data officer. Is that person responsible for information quality? Should that be the CIO's job? Um, as somebody who's got you know five, six years of messing around with this stuff, what do you think about uh, that role? Should there be a data czar, if you will? Should that individual be part of the IT function? How do you guys handle it? I think at the right scale, there's a, there's a, a good reason to have a person who focuses on that, um, on that role. In a smaller organization such as us, we're, uh, we are, in the aggregate, we're about a $130 million organization. Everybody's so, a data czar. Right. <laughs> so, you know, that's sort of distributed. I, I wear that hat, our mm -hmm. analytics team wears that hat, our mm -hmm. business lead wears that hat. 
Uh, but what we did do that's interesting about that, as I said before, we brought those resources together out of IT, out of quality, out of research, and made an analytics center of excellence that focuses on solving these problems. Now, we work very closely with IT. Uh, we work very closely with quality. We work very closely with the, the business line managers in solving these questions. So it's really more about how you communicate and how you work together than any particular structure, I think. Question from Twitter here, Grant Case, one of our most important, his description is uh, an important member of the CrowdChat community uh, uh, has a question. Um, how do you get your organization to buy into that iterative model for data? Um, we didn't ask permission, uh, we, it, and we didn't have much choice. Uh, so we, we started our initiative as a, a bit of a stealth um, initiative. Did you ask for forgiveness, or you, did you get to that part yet? We, <laughs> you didn't? When we make, <laughs> not yet. You know, when we make mistakes, we ask for forgiveness. And so what happens when we put that information out is, you know, there, there are often problems with it. Uh, we use a fairly, uh, you know, agile is an overused term, but a fairly agile approach. We want to get the data out there. We want to get people using it. That then brings ROI. It improves data quality, and it's an iterative improvement process. So, so you get time to value fast enough. We, we have to, we, you know, and we've worked to have a culture where it's okay for the data not to be perfect. Now, I would separate, as I did before, you know, if you're, if you're talking about life or death situations, you can't afford to do that. You have to make sure data quality is there before it gets out. Um, but in a lot of situations, you don't have to do that. If you're just looking at financial information or, or service volume, those kinds of things, you know, weather data, it, you know, it's typically not life or death. So you can, you can get that out there and make, and, you, and the, the noise is, is rarely going to be great enough to actually change the overall um, signal, the picture of the signal that you have. So one of the things uh, we talked about earlier was situational aw awareness um, and context data in motion. Um, Share the folks just some experiences of, of how the data has impacted some of the, just the, the, the folks uh, in, in the community. Any research has come out that's impacted lives? Can you share any insights there? Any examples? Well, I think it, there's sort of a business example and a clinical example. The, the, the business example, a couple of years ago in Indiana, uh, the state was changing how they paid for services. Uh, and this happens every few years in healthcare, and it's happening federally now. And it can be very disruptive to, to systems like us as we figure out, you know, okay, well, the services that, that we were providing are no longer paid for. And the challenge is, it's not just a financial challenge, it's a challenge to how we serve our communities as a, as a mission-driven organization. If we take a funding cut, a significant funding cut, that reduces the services that are available to people out there who need them. That demand doesn't go away. It's just people who are, aren't met. So, we had to focus on using our data to, to um, inform management to make decisions about how do we reconfigure our business given this new set of rules that were handed to us by payers to still meet the, the social need that was out there. And we've done that very effectively. Now, on a clinical side, as, as I have just talked about, um, we've really been thinking about how do we get information into the hands of clinicians that helps them um, helps inform their clinical decision making. So this value issue, how do we help them know when to stop providing treatment um, when they've reached their maximum effectiveness? So we, can, so we don't continue to incur that cost and so we open up a slot so somebody else can get in to see that therapist or doctor. Tom, it's been great chatting with you on theCUBE here. Really appreciate amazing work. I know you guys are a nonprofit. And again, the volunteer activity, we see that with social media, brings that social component together. It's really great stuff. And big data allows you guys to scale and do more. Uh, great, great stuff. We're here live inside theCUBE here at IBM's Information Unmetal in Las Vegas. The hashtag is hashtag IBM IOD. If you want to join the conversation here on theCUBE with myself and Dave, go to the crowdchat.net slash IBM IOD. That's our new crowdchat application. You can sign in with LinkedIn or Twitter and join the conversation, ask questions, uh, and we'll, we'll address the board. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.